Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello to the learners of pathology. Every human being adapts, not only human beings, every living organism adapts to the environment one way or the other. The slogan for today is adapt to survive. If you look at the camel of one of the animals in the living in the animal kingdom, it adapts in various ways to the desert in which it has to live from its hump to the skin to the eyelashes, to the nostrils, everything is adapted for it to survive without water and in that dusty desert. Similar to that, we, if you look at any organism, any organism or any animal, the giraffe, the polar bear in the Arctic, everything adapts to survive to the environment. Human beings, we also in different ways adapt to the environment around us, but today our concern is on adaptation of the cells and the tissues to various stimuli or demands in the body for adapting to survive. So, what we would do today or what you need to take from today's lecture is the tidbits that is the responses of the cell or the tissue to injury, what is adaptation and the different types of adaptations of which we will be looking at hypertrophy hyperplasia and atrophy today and the clinical relevance and some examples of each of these. All living creatures or and all cells, we all of us are normal and we all exist in a state of normal homeostasis. The normal cell has normal functions, normal metabolic um, activity, various things that are there that are normal. But when there is a stress or a demand, maybe it is a functional thing or it is some physiological stimuli, whatever it is, then that cell or the tissue has to adapt. And that is what we mean by adaptation. Most of the adaptations are reversible. And today we will be looking at increased growth in the various forms, decreased growth in the form of atrophy and also altered differentiation that is the way the tissue goes on to specialized functions and alterations in that. Now, that is on one side. Now, if there is an injurious stimuli to that cell be it an infection or be it some chemical, some toxin whatever it is, if there is an injurious stimuli again the cell goes into the injury mode. When it is so, if it is a mild transient injury, then certain reversible changes take place and those are what we call as the hydropic change or the fatty change. If it is a severe progressive injury, then the cell goes on to irreversible cell death and the two forms of cell death are necrosis and apoptosis. So, this is how the various responses to injury are. Today our concentration would be on adaptations most of which are reversible and we look be looking at increased growth, decreased growth and the various forms. Now, what is adaptation? It is a structural or a functional response to any stress. It can be demand, increased demand, increased workload, it can be some other hormonal change, maybe it is a physiological process or it is a pathological process, whatever it is the response to that which makes that cell or tissue to survive that is adapt to survive. So, that is what we mean by adaptation and as I mentioned most of it are irreversible 
and we will be looking at altered growth and differentiation. Today, we will be looking at altered growth alone. Now, adaptations in the structure and the function which we are seeing and which we are going to see first of all we look at the abnormal growths that are seen in tissue. So, the abnormal growth in the tissue can either be in the form of increased growth or it can be decreased growth and we, can, we are going to look at various situations where there are physiological conditions and pathological conditions. In increased growth, which are the main adaptations that occur? We are going to call them as three. They are hypertrophy, hyperplasia or situations where both hypertrophy and hyperplasia occur together. So, we will look at each one of them individually. What is hypertrophy? The word hyper means increase. The word trophy means size. So, hypertrophy is increase in the size, increase in the size of cells and as a result of the increase in the size of the cells, there is an increase in the size of the organ or the tissue. But one important thing is that there is no cell replication. So, that means it is something like this hyper, it is hyper big size of the cell. Again to simplify it and to give it again in a pictorial form, pictorial form increase in size, increase in the organ size, the number is the same, the size increases. Now, how does this happen? We saw what it is, but now how does this happen? We get increase in the cell size. There can be various situations of increased functional demand, there may be stimulation by hormones, there may be growth factors that are coming into the picture, all of them can cause an increased demand on the cells or the tissue which makes the cells to increase in size. And the size increase is mainly by increased production of the cellular components in the cell, the cellular proteins in the cell. So, that makes the cell big and that is how we get hypertrophy. When the cell becomes big, the cytoplasmic components become big and we have the cell that is big and the nucleus also may show increased nuclear material, the nucleus also can become big. Now, we will look at some of the examples, some physiological states of hypertrophy. This is something that is very common with increased workload, skeletal muscle hypertrophy. The bodybuilders, many are proud of their biceps or their triceps or the pectorals. What is happening in that? With the increased workout, the regular increased strenuous workout, what happens is the skeletal muscles undergo hypertrophy. Each skeletal muscle fiber undergoes hypertrophy and we see the musculature of the bodybuilders. So, this is one typical example, physiological example. Another one going on to the pathological example. We can see that in ventricular hypertrophy, be it left ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular hypertrophy. In the heart, there is, if you look at the picture that is depicted, there is a slice or the section of the heart that has been given. The left ventricular muscle, if you are to compare with the right ventricle, the muscle is very much thickened. There is a normal section of the heart in the center. On one side, you have the muscle that is very thick that is there is left ventricular hypertrophy because of an outflow obstruction. There is an outflow obstruction from the left ventricle that means there may be a hypertension, the patient may be a hypertensive or the patient may be having aortic valvular stenosis or something like that that causes an obstruction to the outflow of blood from the left ventricle. So, that the ventricle has to pump more, the muscles become thinker, thicker. When we look at the extreme other diagram, we will see that the whole size of the heart has increased, but the muscle wall is not that increased. That may be because of a certain conditions where we get a dilational or a dilutional hypertrophy. Now, in all these, the microscopy will show each muscle fiber, the cardiac muscle fiber, which is hypertrophied, which is big in size, the cytoplasm and the nucleus are big. 
right ventricular hypertrophy can be seen in conditions where there is a right ventricular uh, outflow obstruction like maybe in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary stenosis. So, these, these are pathological causes of hypertrophy. There are various other conditions also where we can get it. Here again a slice of the heart which shows the left ventricular hypertrophy. If you look at the thickness of the heart, you can see how much it has thickened and that is not because of the increase in the number of cells, but the increase in the number of the or the size of the muscle fi cardiac muscle fibers. Now, going on to the next condition where there is increased growth that is hyperplasia. Hyperplasia, hyper means big, plasia means number of cells are increasing. So, increase in the cell number by cell division resulting in increase in the organ or the tissue is called as hyperplasia. So, to put it simply hyperplasia, hyperplasia again it goes on increasing in number and we get the organ that is increased. So, that is hyperplasia again to de depict it in a in a diagram increase in cell numbers. The size remains the same, but the number of the cells increase. Again, it can be seen in physiological conditions and pathological conditions. Now, how does that happen? How does the tissue undergo hyperplasia? Again, it is be it the stress or the stimuli, there is an adaptation that is occurring that is hyperplasia. It can be a growth factor driven proliferation of the cells. So, growth factors, hormones act on the cell and then the cell goes on increasing in number that is it is proliferating, it is increasing in number. So, also it can be that more new cells are being produced from the stem cells. So, that again there is proliferation, there is mitosis and you have more cells being formed, the organ or the tissue increases in size that is hyperplasia. Here one thought how is hyperplasia different from neoplasia? I am not dwelling on that here, but it is something that I would request all to just consider and to differentiate from how hyperplasia is different from neoplasia. It is important, it is also proliferation, neoplasia is also proliferation, but it is not hyper, it is not a uh, hyperplasia. Now, to look at some of the conditions which are seen where we have hyperplasia. Various physiological conditions are there. Hormonal changes can occur in the body, especially in the females during puberty, the changes that occur in the breast, the increase in the breast size occurs not because of the increase in the size of the cells, but the proliferation or the hyperplasia that occurs in the breast glandular lining cells. Similarly, changes can occur in the uterus and in other tissues as part of the hormonal change. Another physiological condition to give an example is compensatory hyperplasia that occurs with liver regeneration. Liver is a stable cell which proliferates when there is a need or when there is an in in injury. So, liver transplantation is the basis for this regeneration and an example to depict this the liver part of the liver from a donor is, is um, transplanted into a deceased liver. The donor liver that is gone it regenerates in the place and the person has his liver almost back and into the recipient's liver this liver that is gone it again proliferates. So, liver regeneration is a compensatory mechanism of physiological hyperplasia. Another physiological condition, high altitudes, what happens in the high altitude? We know that Tenzing and Hillary uh, conquered the Everest. Person like Tenzing, he is a Sherpa, he lives in the high altitudes and his life has been in the high altitudes. The people who are in the high altitudes, their body gets adjusted to the high altitudes. It is not like us going on a visit to the, uh, to the Himalayas. The bodies of the people there or the they are prone or they are prone to hypoxic changes and they are they have a lot of things that they have to adjust to. 
what happens is in these people there is what is called as bone marrow hyperplasia there is hypoxia in the higher altitudes so to compensate for that bone marrow hyperplasia is there so the hyperplastic bone marrow hematopoietic cells produce a lot of rbc's so that there is polycythemia and that is a protective mechanism that happens one a more example of physiological hyperplasia going on to the pathological conditions here is a clinical situation an endometrial biopsy from a 45 year old female who presented with dysfunctional uterine bleeding her endometrial tissue is shown you have we see the normal endometrium on one side and on the other we see her endometrium which is showing hyperplasia and what do you mean by that you can see that there are so many glands that have proliferated their glands are back to back and the lining of the glands are also increased in numbers so there is hyperplasia and that is the reason for her clinical condition and this is occurring most probably because some home because of some hormonal imbalances that have occurred with increase in estrogens in her body which is causing this hyperplasia then another state a female a 35 year old female with hyperthyroidism she has features of hyperthyroidism and her thyroid which has been removed shows a diffuse enlargement of the thyroid that is both the lobes are enlarged and uh, we see that the whole thyroid is enlarged so there is an increase in the thyroid size but when we look at the microscopy when we look at the epithelium we see that the thyroid glands the follicular lining cells of the thyroid are proliferated too there is hyperplasia of the thyroid tissue so this again is one pathological condition where we can get hyperplasia there are many examples but just to give one or two examples now going on to the third situation where we have both hypertrophy and hyperplasia that is also seen very commonly and many some of these situations have both this these things these uh, changes coexisting so when we have hyperplasia there is increase in the number of cells when we have hypertrophy there is increase in the size of the cells and when we have both we can have increase in the cell size and increase in the cell number to look at some examples in pregnancy a physiological example pregnancy the diagram depicts the normal uterus and also the enlarged uterus you can imagine the difference in the size of the uterus and the uterus has increased in size and we are seeing that the smooth muscles that that form the myometrium they are increased in size we saw the reason for the increase in size the increase in the cellular components and the nuclear components so we are seeing increase in the size of the cells but nowadays it has also been proved that it is not only hypertrophy that happens but also hyperplasia that means the number of cells the smooth muscle cells of the myometrium are also increasing in number there is proliferation of the smooth muscle cells also so that is what we are seeing in pregnancy so it is both hyperplasia and hypertrophy now another example a pathological condition a 70 year old male who has urinary obstruction the organ the arrow shows the urethral orifice the prostate which is lying just below the bladder neck it is enlarged because of the hyperplasia that has occurred of the prostatic glands we call it usually as adenomyomatous hyperplasia what do you mean by that there is hyperplasia of the adeno is the glands hyperplasia of the glands there are so many glands that are proliferating which come back to back and together with increase in the number of cells and also hyperplasia of the the smooth muscle so both are proliferating which gives on to uh, the prostatic hyperplasia which is causing the urinary obstruction which we see in the older age group that's another pathological condition where we see both hypertrophy and hyperplasia now going on to the next condition that is the next form of adaptation where we see decreased growth we looked at increased growth now to look at decreased growth the term that we use is atrophy i would like to introduce one more term here that is hypoplasia which is also decreased growth we will look at these two terms now now what is 
hypoplasia or where do we usually use this word hypoplasia? It is used when we say that there is failure of development of an organ that means as part of morphogenesis or the, the organs being formed some organs do not develop like renal hypoplasia or lung hypoplasia where the organs do not form from the fetus and in the small in the baby. Another term that we use is a genesis when the organ is absent, a means absent, a genesis when the organ is absent. So, that is one way when we look at it when we look at organs hypoplasia. Another way or another situation where we use the word hypoplasia is when we talk of the bone marrow. The bone marrow I am sure you all know is the storage or the factory where the hematopoietic cells are produced the red cells, the white cells and the platelets. The marrow normally is cellular and it has very few fat spaces between them as seen in that picture. When there is a plasia or hypoplasia, the bony trabeculae are seen, but the spaces, the fat spaces increase so much that the hematopoietic cells are very few that are seen in the background. So, when we see such a picture, we will say that the there is hypoplasia or a plasia. The hypo means decrease, plasia is the number of cells, the number of hematopoietic cells are reduced in the marrow. We use this also as a, the term of hypoplasia. Now, coming on to atrophy, what does atrophy mean? Atrophy is decrease in the size of an organ or tissue. And when we talk of decrease in the size of an organ or tissue, we just do not mean decrease in the size only, but it can also mean decrease in the number of cells. And also it can even mean that it can be both. So, we do not have definite separate terms for decrease in the size, decrease in the number or both. If it is decrease in the size or the number or both, we use the term atrophy. Another word that we also use is involution. When we talk of an organ that has reduced in size or shrunken in size, we use the word involution also. So, that is another term to remember. Now, coming on to actually what it is, as I said, it is decrease in the size of the organ, decrease in the size of the cells and maybe both. And again, it is an adaptive response, it is an adaptation to decrease requirements in the body. And when we have atrophy, atrophy, it can be either seen in physiological conditions or in pathological conditions. So, we will look at some of those now. Before that, let us just look at what is the mechanism or how does atrophy occur. We looked at in the other situations too. So, likewise in atrophy, how does it happen? There is decrease in the size, decrease in the cells and also shrinkage of the cells and the tissue. It can be because of decreased protein synthesis or increased protein breakdown. So, that can cause decrease or shrinkage of the cells and the tissue. Another very important mechanism whereby the cells decrease in size or the organ undergoes atrophy is by the process of apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. It is a form of cell death where the cells, the selected cells which have to die are selected and the cells are removed or destroyed or killed. So, that is an important process where atrophy occurs. Now, to look at conditions, physiological conditions we see them in hormone dependent, various hormone dependent conditions like for example, the thymus. The thymus is huge or big in the baby, it because it is required there for various immune functions. But when the child grows, the thymus involutes, it becomes small. Similarly, there are several embryonic structures which are required or which are there during the fetal life, but as the baby is born most of these or many of these disappear like for example, the thyroglossal ducts, parenchyal cleft, the uh, reproductive system that is formed from the Wullerian and the Mulfian uh, system all of them change 
so that they are not there during the adult life and they are all being atrophied and all the process in this is by the process of apoptosis. Now, to look at pathological conditions, we can divide the atrophy into six maybe pathological conditions. One is condition where you can get atrophy is in called as disuse atrophy because of the functional demand that is decreased, decreased physical activity. I am sure there would be some of you at least who have had an accident. Your limb is immobilized in a cast, the muscles do not move for weeks or months altogether. When that happens, when the muscles are in disuse, they undergo atrophy. So, that is called as disuse atrophy. Another one is when there is loss of the nervous system or the innervation supplying the muscles, that is called as denervation atrophy. In cases of infections like poliomyelitis or paraplegics, where their limbs are paralyzed, in those people, because there is no movement again the nerves are required for the functioning of the skeletal muscle, so that there again the skeletal, mu skeletal muscles undergo atrophy. So, that is the second situation, denervation atrophy and the first one we saw was disuse atrophy. Now, the next sit situation is when there is a decrease in the blood supply. This can be seen in senile atrophy of the brain, which we see in the older age group. A young adult you can see that it is showing the surface of the brain, it is a normal gyri and the sulci that we are seeing. In the brain of an 82 or 82 year old person, we can see that the gyri, the sulci are all narrowed and uh, there is a lot of space and the gyri are also thinned out. So, this is what we mean because of the decrease in the blood supply to the brain, it can occur in various other organs too, here we talk of senile atrophy of the brain. The next situation is what we consider as inadequate nutrition. When the nutrition is inadequate, like what we see in protein calorie malnutrition, we see that child there which has marasmus. We can see the bones, but the skeletal muscles are all atrophied and thinned out. It is like we, we would colloquially or in the lay person's term, we would say skin and bone appearance. So, where have the muscles gone? Because of the malnutrition, inadequate nutrition, the muscles have all undergone atrophy. A similar situation can also be seen with extensive muscle wasting, which we call as cachexia. This we see in cancers, in neoplasms, people who are in the late stage of neoplasms or chronic debilitating diseases, they can have generalized muscle wasting and that is called as cachexia. So, these are all because of certain cytokines like tumor necrosis factor and such others that come up and cause the muscles to atrophy. This is inadequate nutrition. Now, the next situation where we can get atrophy, that is called as pressure atrophy. Compression of the tissues by the pressure, this is a bed soap, which can occur in any person who is bedridden for quite some time. Compression of the tissue against the bed or against a hard surface along with ischemia can cause the bed sore to form and this is called as pressure atrophy. Now, in this case if you look at it, it is not just atrophy that is there, there is also a super added uh, infection with even necrosis of the tissues that are there. So, the next situation is a pressure atrophy. I would like to spend a little while for you to just look at this picture. This is actually a Miss Brown, an 18 year old young and beautiful Miss Brown and also a Grandma Brown, maybe 80 year old who is also there in the picture. I hope you are able to identify both these ladies in that same picture which has been reproduced from an artist. What am I trying to convey? A baby, then a young beautiful lady which had so many features when she attained puberty and she had so many changes of hyperplasia and various things happening on and then when it goes to the older lady with old age, so many changes that have happened. So, with old age, there can be changes in the reproductive system, in the uterus, in the vagina which all undergo atrophy 
Then again, there, there are changes in her uh, face, her um, she is edentulous, her gums have undergone high atrophy, her bones would be atrophied. So, all these due to the loss of endocrine stimulation. So, all these are seen as part of senile uh, old age and because of loss of endocrine stimulation. So, with this we have looked at the spectrum of the various things that happen in the normal cell and in the state of normal homeostasis which can be stressed up by various stresses which we looked at may be hormonal, may be growth factors, may be functional demand, whatever. And because of that, they have all undergone an adaptation to survive. They can be structural changes, functional changes and most of these are reversible and we have seen situations where there is increased growth in the form of hypertrophy, hyperplasia or combinations of the two or decreased growth where there is atrophy. That is what we have looked at today. Now, we looked at the various physiological conditions, we looked at the pathological conditions and in atrophy looked at we looked at about 6 situations where we can get pathological atrophy. In decreased growth most of the atrophies that we saw the 6 types of atrophies that we saw are reversible, but there are occasional ones which are also irreversible like the senile atrophy of the brain and so on that happen. So, this is what we looked at and one thing that I want you to look at again is how hyperplasia is different from neoplasia. With this I would like to conclude I wish you all the very best and the slogan for today is adapt to survive. Thank you.